And I'll be covering a really wide variety of things here. First entity I want to talk about is hopefully coming up a few solutions later in the lecture. And I'll start off about brain abscess. And it's important to recognize that brain abscess starts out from a uh, different type of process than uh, a well-formed abscess, and speaking, cerebritis, which is simply an infected region of brain tissue before the abscess capsule forms. Usually, uh, cerebritis and abscesses are due to hematogenous dissemination from places outside the CNS. And so if you know where most of the blood flow goes, you'll know where most abscesses form. And most blood flow in the brain goes to the middle cerebral artery territory. So although we can see abscesses in the brain, uh, the most common location will be in the middle cerebral artery. So here's an example of cerebritis in two different patients. The CT scan shows a patient who uh, was born with a um, uh, immunodeficient uh, autoimmune system, and you can see there's a large area of contrast enhancement with surrounding basic genetic edema. Now this patient could never develop an abscess capsule because he lacked uh, the immune response that would allow it. Uh, the MR image, coronal MR image, shows a blotchy area of contrast enhancement. This is an area of cerebritis that's contrast enhancing. An abscess capsule has not yet formed, but you can see how uh, as central necrosis and uh, uh, pus collection begins in the center, how this might begin to look dark on T1-weighted images as it has more fluid content. And again, you can see surrounding basogenic edema. Now, how does an abscess capsule form? Well, basically, within the first few days after development of cerebritis, there's an organized reaction by macrophages and fibroblasts, which encircle and wall off the infection leaving a central region of purulent material which has different density on CT and different signal intensity on MR than the capsule. So here is a patient with well-defined abscess, and uh, by now the area of cerebritis has uh, matured into a rim-enhancing collection which has a central region of low density and a contrast-enhancing, smooth, smoothly marginated wall. And that's relatively characteristic for an abscess. <laughs> Note that the inner margin is smooth, and uh, although that can be seen in tumors, it's much more common in abscesses. And that's one way that you can uh, distinguish the two apart. This shows it, I think, a little bit better. You can see, again, that uh, there are multiple rim-enhancing lesions. Here, they've gone up to the cubrobasilar circulation to land in the cerebellum as well as the supratentorial brain. And again, you can see that the inner margin is smooth. Uh, they're grounded in location. But it does bring up the point of how one would distinguish an abscess from other ring-enhancing lesions. The most common entity with which you need to distinguish it is that of a metastasis. In other words, assuming that you have multiple ring-enhancing lesions. And the difficulty comes from the fact that not only are they both rent enhancing, but they both tend to occur at the cortical medullary junction because they both arise via hematogenous dissemination. There are a couple of pointers that I can give you. One is that abscesses often have a smaller lesion right next to them. That's called a uh, daughter lesion. Um, and that's a distinguishing feature that you will only uncommonly see in tumors. I've already mentioned the smooth inner margin of the enhancing rim. And then sometimes one can be helped by the fact that the thicker side of the rim is the one facing the brain cortex because there's preferentially greater blood flow there. So here on CT and MR, two different patients, you can see that there is uh, a mass lesion here that's rim enhancing, but also note that there is a smaller lesion just adjacent to it. In fact, you can see how the two are connected. And this is how a satellite lesion forms, period of material leaks out, is walled off. Here you can see another uh, daughter lesion or satellite lesion, uh, typical of abscesses. Here you can see the smooth inner rim that I talked about earlier, and you can see that sometimes on T2-weighted images, the internal matrix of the um, abscess contents are not uh, a single signal intensity. You can see here this has a very mixed signal intensity. One of the more helpful features is what the lesion looks like on T2-weighted images. So this is an abscess with multiple satellite or daughter lesions around it, a lot of basogenic edema. But please note that the rim of the lesion is dark on T2-weighted images. And this is 
uh, very common in abscesses and only uh, uncommonly seen in tumors. And it may be due to the fact that there are uh, the chemical composition of the abscess wall uh, produces T2 dark signal, some chemical uh, interaction occurring, uh, but it's not seen commonly in tumors and it's a helpful sign. On diffusion weighted images, often the contents of an abscess are bright on diffusion weighted images, and here you can see an example uh, of that. And this is due to restricted diffusion due to the uh, thick contents of the pus within the abscess. Now another form of abscess you can see is not within the brain cavity at all. It's within the epidural compartment in the spine, usually due to staph aureus infection. You may have one spinal level or multiple levels involved. There are certain risk factors that are well known, including immunocompromised state, diabetes, intravenous drug use. The patients typically will present with a low-grade fever and back pain. If the lesion becomes big enough, they'll develop myelopathy. And again, these are usually due to hematogenous spread. They're often uh, seen in conjunction with discitis and osteomyelitis. So if you have uh, a mass in the epidural compartment, usually they'll be in the anterior epidural compartment and look for helpful clues like the presence of discitis or osteomyelitis to guide you away from other entities such as a hematoma or a neoplasm and towards abscess. So here's what they look like on CT myelography. It's simply and uh, a soft tissue density that's pushing the fecal sac posteriorly, there's nothing really characteristic about it. This could be tumor, could be something else. It so happened that this patient had a, uh, uh, an area of lysis within the bone, and this was due to osteomyelitis in this case. This patient has, on um, CT, you can see the actual erosion of the bone by the soft tissue mass. So this is discitis. And you can see that now the mass has encroached into the anterior portion of the spinal epidural compartment. So this is discitis, uh, I'm sorry, osteomyelitis and spinal epidural abscess. And here is that same patient on a proton density sagittal image. You can see here is the mass that you saw on the CT. You can see it's lifting up the dura here, seen as this black line. It's clearly an extra axial or extra dural mass. You can also see that there's involvement of the disc. So this is discitis, and there's also involvement of the vertebral body. So here you have the triad of discitis, osteomyelitis, and spinal epidural abscess. And here is another case on MR where you can see there's marked erosion of the vertebral body. There is thickening and contrast enhancement of the epidural space, excuse me, of the disc space uh, due to uh, loculated purulent material within it. And here on the T2 weighted image, you can see that the material in the Epidural abscess is quite bright. So again, uh, how would you distinguish these uh, from other entities like metastases? Well, here you can see that the disc space is widened here. There's erosion of the end plates in the case of abscess. Uh, in um, metastases, uh, instead of seeing an appearance like this, the disc space usually appear normal, and there are multifocal areas of uh, abnormal signal. So it's quite a different appearance. And here you can see that there, in the abscess case, there's enhancement of the disc material, and here there's not in the uh, metastasis. Let's talk about another focal uh, infection, and that is subdural empyema, which is an infective process that's confined to the subdural compartment. We most commonly see it within uh, in the intracranial compartment, rather right, than the spine. It can arise via numerous mechanisms, often via local extension, perhaps from meningitis or from mastoiditis, sometimes post-traumatic or uh, also relatively commonly would be hematogenous dissemination in a patient who has sepsis. Clinically, the patients appear very sick and the imaging findings are relatively subtle. And they're not too subtle in these cases, uh, but they, these do show quite well. You can see there's a and rib enhancing extra axial collection on the T1 weighted image is very dark. Here there's a very thick rim. This is a uh, relatively characteristic CT appearance where if you're not looking carefully on this contrast enhanced scan, all you see is a low density uh, subdural collection, which could be a hematoma. Until you look carefully here and see that there is enhancement along the rim of the cavity. And this is a uh, 
very common finding in subdural empyema, and it's the sort of thing that you should be looking for if you suspect subdural empyema and are uncertain whether you're dealing with, dealing with hematoma or infection. Here's the same patient seen three different ways with MR imaging. You can see that there is a rim-enhancing subdural collection on the flare image, the pus within the collection does not suppress in the same way that CSF does, so it has brighter signal. And even on the diffusion-weighted image, you can see that there is abnormal diffusion. In fact, there's restricted diffusion due to the fact that the purulent collection doesn't allow water diffusion very easily. Now, I want to talk about more diffuse, less focal abnormalities. First one will be encephalitis. Most of the time, uh, the exact organism is not known or never determined. But one of the uh, encephalitides with which we commonly have to deal is herpes simplex virus infection. And in the adult patient, we're usually talking about HSV-1. HSV-2 is a disease of neonates, and it's a systemic infection with, with multi-organ involvement, such as liver and spleen, and so on. Whereas the HSV-1 is confined to the brain, and usually in the temporal lobes and the limbic system. So, I'll show you mul multiple images from the same patient. Here you can see that there is marked swelling in the temporal lobe in this patient. Uh, why is this not an infarction? Well, it involves multiple territories. It involves the middle cerebral artery territory laterally, and the posterior cerebral artery territory medial. So it's not really a great, uh, could make a great case for an infarction. In addition, there's involvement of the insula, which is very common in herpes infection, and there's a little bit of rim enhancement. Again, these are features that are much more common uh, in uh, HSV-1 encephalitis than in infarction, for example, or other infections. Same patient, unenhanced C1, you just see swelling in the temporal lobe after we administer contrast. There's often this kind of patchy enhancement. You can see uh, enhancement of the amygdaloid complex here. In a different patient, at a later stage in the disease, you can see that there's bilateral uh, hippocampal contrast enhancement. And this shows one of the characteristic features of the disease, that is bilateral involvement, both temporal lobes, hippocampi, and the limbic system. So if you're considering the diagnosis of HSV encephalitis, uh, you should think about uh, or look for signs of bilateral involvement. And that will steer you away from other entities like infarctions and tumors. <coughs> So here's a uh, patient we've been following along with CT. You can see that there's a little bit of contrast enhancement of the uh, insular cortex. But importantly, there's involvement of the inferior frontal lobe and the opposite insula. You will not see this in any other entity uh, with any probability other than HSV. So look for opposite hemispheric involvement, specifically in the insula, and look for inferior frontal lobe involvement. And here is a disease that looks like HSV-1. It's called human herpes virus 6 encephalitis. Here's a diffusion-weighted image. And you can see here that there is involvement of the uh, insular cortex bilateral. And this can look for all the world like uh, HSV-1 infection. It's something to keep in mind as part of the differential diagnosis. So uh, let's talk about uh, other forms of infection, more diffuse infections, meningitides. Typically, we don't need imaging to make the diagnosis. The patient presents with headache and neutral rigidity and uh, undergoes lumbar puncture. And the diagnosis, if it's bacterial, is made pretty easily by lumbar puncture. Most of the time, no bacterial or fungal organisms are found because the most common entity to cause meningitis is uh, one of the many different types of viruses. So usually, one has viral encephalitis, they have viral meningitis, and no imaging is needed. Sometimes, in bacterial or fungal meningitis, however, complications result, such as hydrocephalus and empyema, in which case imaging is helpful. So here's a patient who has bacterial meningitis, contrast enhanced t one weighted image. You can see multiple small foci of enhancement. Now, more commonly, one will see uh, a laminar type contrast enhancement. This is an unusual case. This will show you a, a variation on the more common theme. But on the flare image, because purulent material is present in the CSF, you can see that the CSF does not suppress. Instead, it has very bright signal. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a common finding and helpful 
uh, technique in uh, looking for meningitis. Now here's a patient who had uh, fungal meningitis, and you can see these thick exudates which are extending out uh, along the base of brain and around the midbrain here and along the cranial nerves, and there's resulting mild hydrocephalus because CSF resorption patterns are interrupted. Now I want to talk about sister sarcosis very briefly. This is un unfortunately a uh, disease we see more and more commonly. Uh, it's uh, caused by ingestion of the cork tapeworm and uh, spread in a hematogenous manner. It can involve various different uh, areas within the brain. So it can involve parenchyma, ventricular system, or a CSF. And typically, one only has initially a, a very mild inflammatory response with no contrast enhancement, but with larval death, of course, one gets a very profound inflammatory response and contrast enhancement. So here's a patient, this is a contrast in CT, and you can see that there are large cystic lesions with little uh, small areas of contrast enhancement around them. This is uh, relatively typical. Uh, as the uh, disease progresses and with the healing response, the lesions become smaller. One often sees a little calcification along the rim as the lesions are treated. Now here's a case of intraventricular sister sarcosis, and you see the lesion here in the fourth ventricle. This is not solely hydrocephalus, although it is causing enlargement uh, of the remainder of the ventricular system due to non-communicating uh, hydrocephalus and inferior displacement of the tonsils. Now here is so-called racemos sister sarcosis. It occurs in the CSF spaces, so these are all extra axial lesions. And you can even see little tiny dots on the T2-weighted images and on the T1 that probably represent the uh, scolix. Uh, and so you'll often see these little target-like findings. Another entity I, I mentioned is causing uh, meningitis is tuberculosis, usually due to mycobacterium tuberculosis. And one of the characteristic features of these very thick enhancing exudates over the surface of the brain, over the tentorium, as you see here. Uh, we'll end up on talking about AIDS-related conditions very briefly. Toxoplasmosis is one of the more common ones we see. It can occur anywhere in the brain. Thalamus, basal ganglia, or diffusely throughout the uh, brain are more common locations. They have these features, usually rim enhancement on t one weighted images, or tense lesions on T2. And here's a classic uh, appearance to different patients. You can see these daughter lesions around the, the dominant lesions, consistent with an abscess. Uh, you can see that on the T1-weighted contrast enhanced image, they will either rim enhance or they may appear to solidly uh, enhance and can mimic mass lesions. So it's important to know the immune status of the patient in that setting. Now here's a patient, the usual treatment is with antibiotics, and here's a patient uh, on, in uh, the image with the large uh, lesion with edema, you can see that uh, there's a lot of mass effect. This is toxoplasmosis, and they're usually treated presumptively with antibiotics. And the same patient two weeks later, you can see that the lesion has virtually disappeared. So typically, these are treated with antibiotics. If they uh, get better within the first two weeks, then it's presumed toxo no biopsy is necessary. If they don't get better, then we have to think about other entities, other abscesses, or even CNS uh, lymphoma, which is a complication of the AIDS. And in that case, the patient will often go brain biopsy. So here's a toxoplasmosis lesion. You can see a large amount of edema around a relatively small lesion. You can see that there's restricted diffusion, uh, again, uh, due to uh, restriction within the abscess cavities. And on the ADC map, you can see it's dark, consistent with restricted diffusion. So I'll end up with a couple of other AIDS-related conditions, HIV encephalitis produces a progressive dementia over many months and is characterized by atrophy. And the classic appearance is uh, a patient who goes from having some sulfo enlargement to marked degree of atrophy over the course of a few months. This is direct infection of brain tissue by the HIV virus. Uh, and um, it has to be distinguished from another AIDS-related entity, which is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. 
And this is due to an entity called the KC virus. The patients often have visual loss and focal motor deficits. And again, they usually have focal lesions as opposed to the HIV encephalitis, which is a diffuse infection. Now, PML it can be low density on CT. They may enhance, but they often are unenhancing. They're bright on T2 and dark on T1. Typically, they don't contrast enhance or have much mass effect. So here's a classic appearance of PML. You can see a large infiltrated lesion after administration of contrast material. <clears throat> the lesion did not contrast the cancer and was spread on P2. So among all these entities, we need to distinguish infections in the AIDS patient from lymphoma. And so what does lymphoma look like? Well, there, it characteristically is in, intraparenchymal masses there may be leptomeningeal extension, or they may extend into the ventricles. Patients present with any myriad of neurologic symptoms and signs, typically headache. Now, one of the things we've learned over the years is that the lymphoma in the AIDS population looks somewhat different from the non-AIDS population. Primary CNS lymphoma in patients who don't have AIDS typically are multiple lesions, hyperdense on unenhanced CT with homogeneous contrast on the other hand, the AIDS patient typically has hypodense lesions that are rim enhancing. So here is uh, a patient who does not have AIDS. You can see these homogeneously enhancing mass lesions, somewhat different from the rim enhancing mass lesion that one sees in the AIDS patient. Again, there, no rule is 100%, but this is a pretty good rule. Uh, and you can see why CNS lymphoma in the AIDS patient could mimic an abscess, and, and specifically coxoplasmosis. On MR, uh, the lesions are dark on T1 and bright on T2. And we often have to resort to uh, uh, PET or SPECT imaging to make the distinction uh, of lymphoma from uh, infection. And it's a helpful tool because it's non-invasive. And here you can see on this PET image, there's a high degree of glucose metabolism, which is characteristic of tumors, but not typically seen in infection. And so the diagnosis can often be made uh, presumptively on a PET scan, and these patients will often subsequently go on to biopsy. Finally, uh, I'll briefly speak about cryptococcosis just to show you some examples. Here is a patient with meningitis and appendymitis due to cryptococcal meningitis, which is the most common form of cryptococcal infection. You can see there's involvement in the ventricular system. This is what the pseudocysts, these gelatinous collections in the base of the brain, look like on uh, CT. They are rounded hypodensities that fill the perivascular spaces or Virchowal band spaces and just plug them up with <coughs> gelatinous material due to the infective organism. And on MR, they have a similar appearance. They're rounded, have a little bit of mass effect, and are bright on T2 images. So that wraps up the CNS infection portion, and I'm now going to proceed to talk about the disease of white matter. So I think this is a complex subject, and the easiest way to approach white matter disorders is with a simple question. Is the disease process I'm looking at due to destruction of myelin that was formerly normal? Or is it the disease process failure to produce normal myelin? The former entity is called demyelination, and multiple sclerosis is the most common example we see of that. This myelination, there are many unusual diseases and relatively rare diseases that produce that. We'll go through it briefly. Among the demyelinating diseases, we have multiple sclerosis, and another entity called this acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM. Briefly, uh, multiple sclerosis typically occurs in young adulthood. The lesions are multiple in space and time, often a waxing and waning clinical course, so the patient may have one neurologic symptom over the course of a few weeks or months with remission and then involvement of a different portion of the CNS uh, later on. The lesions are due to foci of demyelination called plaques that contain macrophages that start to destroy myelin. The lesions are typically periventricular, they're commonly oval in shape, and 
they are usually a few millimeters to many millimeters in size, but typically less than one centimeter. As they coalesce, they may start to develop larger lesions, or occasionally one may get a very large lesion uh, that often is termed a tumefactive MS lesion that simulates a tumor. On CT, they're hypodense. They're much harder to pick out than on MR imaging. They usually don't contrast with MS, but occasionally one can see it. So here's an example. This is a young patient who has this very focal area of low density. There's another area posterior to it. They are relatively close to the ventricular system. Um, there are a number of entities which they simulate. Could be uh, tumor, could be infarction, whatever. We spent some time trying to distinguish them. But uh, ultimately, the point I'm trying to make is that CT is relatively uh, insensitive and nonspecific. On MR, we can get some useful clues. They off, these lesions are often perpendicular to the ventricular surface, an entity that's been termed Dawson's fingers. And these are due to the fact that the inflammatory changes occur along the long axis of the medullary vein, which usually are at a 90 degree angle to the ventricular surface. So here you can see multiple oval lesions that are perpendicular to the ventricular surface. And they occur because there are medullary veins that are entering into the ventricular system, and these lesions occur around those veins. Since veins are linear structures, these are uh, cylindrical or oval structures on a cross axis image. And here you can see on a uh, parasagittal image these lesions emanating from the ventricular surface, very characteristic for MS. Things we look for to try to distinguish MS from other entities, I've already mentioned the uh, perpendicular orientation to the ventricular system, also <coughs> look for involvement of the corpus callosum. So here you can see a large lesion that is starting to involve the genitive uh, splenium of the corpus callosum. Here you can see characteristic pattern as the lesions are emanating from the ventricular system. You can also see that sometimes the lesions extend into, uh, can involve gray matter. It's uncommon, but it occurs in about 5% of cases. So again, periventricular oriented lateral, uh, perpendicular to the ventricles. Another favorite area is the middle cerebral peduncle, excuse me, the middle cerebellar peduncle, which is the structure that connects the pons to the cerebellum. So uh, there are very few entities that actually involve the middle cerebellar peduncle. So if one sees lesions there, and especially if one sees coexisting lesions in the periventricular regions, one feels pretty confident that you're dealing with MS. The lesions will often contrast enhance in the acute phase. And so here you can see a lesion, multiple lesions that are bright on T2, and with some of them uh, contrast enhancing after the contrast is administered. Now another entity that looks somewhat similar to MS because it's a demyelinating lesion is ADEM, which usually occurs following a viral infection or a vaccination. It's probably an autoimmune response against the viral envelope which may be uh, also its uh, etiology post-vaccination. It's ventricular bright matter. So here you can see multiple areas of uh, ill-defined bright signal on T2. And you can see there's multiple areas of contrast enhancement. This is relative, would be relatively atypical for multiple sclerosis. They are not particularly uh, uh, ovoid, not perpendicular to the ventricular system. Instead, they're broadly based and uh, relatively uh, ill-defined. Uh, here's another lesion, uh, which is somewhat large and mass-like, and also is contrast-enhancing in multiple regions. Now let's turn to talk about dysmyelinating diseases, since these are, uh, you're probably less familiar with these, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about them. Typically, these are referred to as leukodystrophies. These are diseases in which normal myelin never fully forms. They're typically infancy, uh, infantile and early childhood diseases. I will talk very briefly about five major ones. There are many others, and uh, I think if you uh, have a passing familiarity with these five diseases, you're probably in good shape. So adrenal dystrophy is probably the most common of these five that we see. It's X-linked, so it occurs in males. Typically, they are in the first decade of life, usually around four to eight years old. 
Classically, the disease in this form starts in the posterior white matter. Uh, there is a neonatal form where the entire white matter uh, is involved simultaneously, but the most common type that you'll see is the excellent uh, form. And here's a classic example of it. You can see that the posterior white matter is involved. There is rim enhancement of the white matter underneath. And it will be the leading edge, which means the area of most recent demyelination will contrast enhancing. And if the disease is left unchecked, it will proceed from uh, posterior so that more anterior structures will be involved. I think if you're familiar with that, you have a pretty good handle on interleukin dystrophy. Now, Crab A disease is a rare disease, which actually you see a lot of at Duke because the patients undergo stem cell transplantation with good effect. The symptoms usually begin within the first six months of life. And these are, unlike adrenal leukin dystrophy, they're widely scattered lesions. They're somewhat ill-defined. One may see corticospinal tract right signal, which is probably due to Wallerian degeneration. And here's a pretty typical case. You can see multiple periventricular abnormalities, but also lesions out here in the central semial valley and even in the subcortical white matter. You can see here that the genuine the corpus callosum is not involved in this case. So these are widely scattered abnormalities. There's nothing specific about them, but they are. But the appearance is somewhat different from adrenal leukodystrophy. <coughs> and as I'll show you from other human dystrophies. So just multiple punched out lesions should make you think of the diagnosis. Now compare that to this entity, which is metachromatic human dystrophy. Uh, there is no one preferential white matter pattern, but I'm going to show you the one that I most commonly see. The cerebellum is often involved. The pattern I most commonly have seen, and I've seen a large number of cases now, because they also come in for stem cell transplantation, is this appearance that looks like a Rorschach blot test, ink blot test. So diffuse uh, white matter involvement. It looks like the brain's been folded on itself on an ink blot. So you can see that it's the entire white matter that's involved in a, a very a uniform manner. So it's, this is different from adrenal leukodystrophy. It's different from Crab A disease, according to the examples I've shown you. Now, there are two diseases that you need to have some passing familiarity with. They both occur in the first year of life. They both produce a large head. They are Alexander's disease and Panavan's disease. Um, they, are, they differ from one another in, by a couple of different features. Alexander's disease typically starts in the frontal white matter, so it's like the mirror image of adrenal leukodystrophy. Whereas Panavan's disease <coughs> diffusely involves the white matter without any frontal or posterior involvement. Now, one of the characteristic things, although you rarely see it, uh, is on MR spectroscopy, Hanavan's disease has elevated N acetyl uh, aspartate, so elevated NAN. It's the only disease that I know of that produces that because most other diseases produce decreased NAA. So it's a characteristic feature. Now, this is not Hanavan's disease. This is, a, this is Alexander's disease. Um, so just look at the image and forget the title. You can see here that the frontal white matter is much more involved than the posterior white matter. So this is characteristic of Alexander's disease. Now I'm going to end up by talking about a number of different other entities that are typically seen in adults. They are, uh, now we're back to demyelinating diseases uh, because they're, they're, this is deterioration of normal white matter. And there are lots of different entities that can do it. Uh, so just to run through the gamut relatively quickly, vascular causes, so vasculitis, like, uh, patients with lupus uh, often will develop these small uh, white matter lesions. Vascular malformations can do it. The corner infarction, small infarctions within the white matter. Here's a patient with lupus who has multiple lesions with uh, somewhat ischemic looking in nature because they don't fit any one pattern. They don't look like multiple sclerosis or any of the dystrophies I showed you. And this patient had multiple small vessel involvement at angiography. Now, older patients can develop an entity called arteriosclerotic encephalopathy, where the medullary arteries are also uh, involved. They can look like that lupus patient I showed you. But the clinical presentation is different. They often have hypertension and present with dementia. 
with a large amount of vasogenic edema. The last lesion uh, in this survey that can produce white matter abnormalities is the trauma, uh, in which case the lesions can be uh, within the white matter an entity called diffuse axonal injury due to rotational and shear stress forces exerted either here in the cortical white matter or in this case deep down into the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is stretched and torn. So uh, it's clear that one needs to take into account the clinical history that is given to you, uh, in on whether it's traumatic, infective, therapy, or whatever. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to take your questions. within the sacrum and the clivus, but they can occur anywhere within the axial skeleton 
and uh, produce some very bizarre appearances. When you're considering uh, unusual lesions in the axial skeleton, particularly in the cervical spine, where you're considering large herniated discs, even schwannomas or unusual infections, chordoma may be a consideration that you also want to include. Giant cell tumors, uh, which you'll see uh, also in musculoskeletal imaging, 5% of these occur in the spine. Uh, there is malignant degeneration in 5 to 10%. These are predominantly lytic lesions that can also arise in the posterior elements. And they tend to have a heterogeneous appearance on MR, partly because they can contain blood products. A mangioma is a classic imaging uh, case that you may see from time to time. On plain films, you're going to see this classic striation pattern with increased density throughout the vertebral body. Uh, essentially, these lesions are uh, mature vascular stroma, mature adult vessels surrounded by a reactive osseous network. And these, this mangiomas uh, may extend into the pedicles, arches, sinus processes, and when they're aggressive, they can even extend into the epidural spaces. And so we're going to define, uh, divide uh, mangiomas into indolent and aggressive types. Indolent, we see all the time. These are pre-contrast T1 hyperintense and T2 hyperintense foci, often multiple. Uh, sometimes the, the appearance can mimic somewhat uh, the appearance you see on plain films with these vertical striations. The more uh, difficult lesion to interpret sometimes is the aggressive hemangioma, which can be low on T1 and high on T2, and therefore begin to look like just about any other uh, particularly malignant process that can occur in the spine. Uh, what can help, though, is on the T1-weighted images in particular, you can see these foci of hypo-intensity, which correspond to the striation. Uh, but as we can see in the aggressive types, these, these lesions can extend into the epidural space. They can cause cord compression, quadriaquina compression, and they can be treated with embolization, alcohol, ablation, hypoplasty, or vertebroplasty. EG is another uh, disease process which you will hear more about pediatrics and musculoskeletal imaging. It primarily involves children, uh, it predominantly involves the vertebral body, and the classic uh, case presentation is uh, vertebral plano, which is complete collapse of the vertebral body with preservation of the disc spaces. Paget's disease is another example. Of a, of a lesion that you're probably going to hear more about musculoskeletal imaging. This occurs in older individuals. There's three classic radiographic phases, spanning from lytic to blastic. The blastics are the most uh, typical cases that you're going to see uh, in case presentations uh, involving thickening of the cortex and course deprivation. Basically, what's going to help you with Paget's disease over other disease processes that can give you a so-called high revertebral appearance is the expansion of the vertebral body. And when you see that expansion, that really helps you to, uh, increase your confidence to determine that it's patents and, and not metastatic disease. However, if it's more uniform and you don't have that expansion, then you kind of start thinking about things like lymphoma and prostate mass. Osteoid osteoma is an example of a benign lesion that can occur in the posterior elements. Um, these are defined uh, in contrast to osteoblastomas by being less than 1.5 centimeters. Uh, they typically involve the posterior elements and transverse processes, and they classically have this leg or calcific level surrounded by a sclerotic rim. Osteoblastomas uh, are sometimes called giant osteoid osteomas, and they can be defined by lesions that are greater than 1.5 centimeters. <laughs> These lesions can often extend into the vertebral body, but otherwise have you know, similar imaging appearances to uh, osteoid osteomas. Aneurysmal bone cysts, again, <clears throat> very expansile lytic lesions with uh, occasional hemorrhage and fluid levels, which are classic on MR imaging. They typically arise in the posterior elements, and especially within the lamina. So now that we've talked about neoplasm, I want to cover the, the general process of Compression fractures, just because not only neoplastic disease, but also infection and um, <clears throat> other lesions can produce compression fractures. And uh, there's a couple features about compression fractures that uh, bear uh, going over. Um, the first is just to discuss briefly the three column theory of, of the spine that was originally presented by Dennis, basically the anterior column involving the anterior half of the vertebral body. 
and the anterior longitudinal ligament. The middle column is the posterior half of the vertebral body and the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then the posterior column is everything posterior to that. The reason I bring this up is because uh, when when you're talking about stable versus unstable compression fractures, basically an unstable lesion is anything that involves two or more columns. Um, also, uh, the definition of a burst fracture is essentially a compression fracture that involves the middle column. <coughs> compression fractures <coughs> can sometimes be difficult to uh, determine what the etiology is because traumatic osteoporotic and pathologic fractures can all have similar signal intensities and all can enhance. So what you will read about in textbooks often is that if you have any residual in the normal marrow, no paraspinal soft tissue process and sparing of the posterior elements, you're thinking about a benign lesion. And in contrast, the malignant lesion, you're thinking about diffuse marrow replacement, prominent paraspinal or epidural soft tissue disease, posterior element involvement, cortical destruction. Obviously, if you have evidence of metastatic disease elsewhere in the spine, that's certainly a good tip-off. An additional feature which may help However, it's also with benign fractures, we tend to more often see rather angular and sharp borders uh, uh, of the vertebral body despite the compression and reality, where, whereas with malignant processes, we may see more rounded borders. And just by way of an example, here we can see a decreased signal intensity compression deformity pre-contrast in T1, which diffusely enhances post-contrast. But if we look at the borders, we can see that these borders are actually fairly sharp. And in contrast, we have an enhancing compression abnormality below, where we see this rounded margin posteriorly that's causing mass effect on the cord, and this is going to be malignant compression abnormality. And then another example here, we see a compression abnormality primarily involving the anterior cortex, but we get a bit of height loss posteriorly, but the margins remain fairly sharp. Here we see an enhancing compression abnormality with a rounded margin posteriorly, that's going to be a pathological. Now I want to turn our attention to infectious disease. Uh, by far the most common infectious process in both of the spines, pyogenic or bacterial infections. These begin in the subchondral endplate in adults. This is in contrast to children who have some residual blood supply in the disc. Uh, that's why sometimes you can see discitis in children, but isolated discitis in the adult is actually extremely rare. You should probably be thinking about something else if that's all you're seeing is enhancement of this and no other abnormality. Um, pyogenic infections almost always involve the disc, however, once they involve or start in the subchondral end plate. This is in contrast to tuberculosis infections, which can spare the disc at least early on. What you want to be sure you see and what can help you, especially when you're trying to distinguish infection from, say, degenerative processes like motive type 1 changes, is erosion of the end plates in conjunction with enhancement. And uh, certainly paraspinal epidural disease is a good tip-off as well. With tuberculosis infections, you're seeing more prominent paraspinal and epidural disease. Um, you're more likely to spare the discs, although these will usually enhance nonetheless. You may see more bone destruction. Uh, in some cases of tuberculosis, you might actually see intraosseous abscesses. And remember that infection spreads along the anterior longitudinal ligament and can, as, as a result, uh, produce skip levels of involvement. Epidural abscesses can be direct extension from discitis osteomyelitis or hematogenous uh, spread, in which case they usually end up in the dorsal epidural space. Epidural abscesses could either be a phlegmon-like uh, inflammation with microabscesses and actually look more like soft tissue involvement, or they can be frank fluid collections. One of the things that you've got to be looking for, which is a sequela of epidural abscesses sometimes, is the presence of septic thrombophlebitis cord and, and, and cord infarction as a consequence. So when you're trying to distinguish pyogenic infection from <coughs> PE and neoplasm, uh, there's a, a number of places where you can see charts like this. Uh, the things to keep in mind, uh, and certainly when you're taking a case, and certainly when you're interpreting as a board, is to think about neoplasm rarely involves the disc base. Uh, paraspinous masses are much more likely to be seen, or certainly more likely to be prominent neoplasm in TB, but they're certainly possible with bacterial infections. Bacterial infections almost always avoid the posterior elements unless it's it's just a massive infection. 
and the spread <coughs> is usually continuous with bacterial infections, um, whereas you're more likely to see other people with full disease with neoplasm and sometimes with tuberculosis as well, where you have skipped areas that are normal. To talk about the generative disease in and of itself, it's not the most interesting topic, but one of the sources of confusion is terminology. So I'd like to spend just a moment talking about terminology. When we think about a disc, it's sometimes easiest to think about it as an oval divided into four quadrants. When we talk about symmetric bulging discs, therefore, we talk about disc uh, herniations that involve all four quadrants. Asymmetrically, we're talking about more involvement in some quadrants than others. With a broad based disc herniation, we're talking about two quadrants of involvement and a focal herniation, we're talking about one quadrant. With protrusion, I'm going to talk about a couple other terms that apply to disc herniations. When we talk about protrusion, we're talking about a process that involves tearing of the in, inner annular fibers, but the other fibers will be intact. And by definition, the protrusion then does not extend beyond the plane of the disc. <clears throat> With extrusion, we're talking about herniations through all the annular fibers and disc material that extends above or below the plane of the disc and is narrower at the base than at the widest portion of the disc herniation. Free fragments or sequestered discs are pretty self-explanatory. And annular tears are not uncommon. Uh, they usually involve high two globular or focal signal in the posterior discs. You can sometimes see these in the absence of disc herniations, uh, in which case they're sometimes associated with disc degenerative pain. Schmorl's notes uh, can present a clinical conundrum from time to time because in the <coughs> acute phase, not only are these extremely painful, uh, but they can also produce a lot of edema and enhancement and mimic infection or metastatic disease. Schmorl's nodes are essentially intervertebral herniations. They tend to occur in characteristic locations involving the central portion of the end plate rupturing into the center of the vertebral body. Schmorl's nodes are always going to begin and involve the end plate. You're never going to see a Schmorl's node in isolation. Um, if there's no clinical history uh, or laboratory evidence of infection, and certainly no history of metastatic disease in a young patient, these are the kind of lesions when they have characteristic appearances of a Schmorl's node that can be followed up short term to confirm that they are indeed herniations and not some sort of infection. Another uh, characterization that's worth mentioning briefly are the motive changes, which probably have all heard about from time to time. Type 1 changes involve low T1, high T2 end plate changes. Type 2 are high T1, T2, that's because of fatty marrow replacement. And then low T1 and low T2 on type 3, which is basically because of sclerosis. The point of bringing up motive changes is because in this early type 1 phase, you may see some disc enhancement, and this could be confused with infection. The key is that there is no other evidence of infection uh, in the patient, certainly no laboratory values, but uh, we're also talking about preservation of the end plates. There's no erosion of the end plates, and certainly no parasitic involvement as well. Another category of, <clears throat> of things to mention when we're talking about degenerative disease are postoperative complications. Uh, certainly infection and abscess uh, is something that we've already talked about. Pseudomenagoceles, which are essentially contained CSF leads from tears in the dura, and arachnoiditis, which can be seen as clump nerve roots. A pseudomass, where you have clump nerve roots, plus a little bit of uh, inflammatory tissue, or even an empty sacs on where the nerve roots pace themselves along the uh, inner surface of the fecal sac. Another clinical conundrum from time to time is scar versus recurrent disc. Uh, we all know that scar tissue tends to conform to a space. It certainly enhances with contrast. But the key is that no matter how much tissue you see, you shouldn't really see any mass effect. Notice the distribution of the nerve roots here are in an anatomically correct position. This is in contrast to discs some of which can enhance in the acute phase, as in this case right here in the left lateral recess. But in contrast to scar here, uh, tissue, there's mass effect. And in fact, that's probably the most important sign of a recurrent or residual disc, the presence of mass effect as compared to just enhancement versus no enhancement. Here you can see the, the nerve root deflected posteriorly here. <coughs> 
Degenerative disease obviously also involves the facet joints, uh, perhaps the most common uh, or important sequela to consider here uh, with facet disease are synovial cysts. These can have very bizarre appearances, particularly on sagittal imaging, because they contain they can contain calcium, uh, nitrogen gas from the facet joint. They can also ingest. Uh, probably the main differential diagnosis in, in many of these cases is an extruded posterior disc, but certainly in the absence of associated degenerative disc disease at the given level and the presence of facet degenerative disease, these are usually not a, a clinical conundrum. Another disease process we'll be mentioning briefly is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. This is actually much easier to see on CT and on plain film than on MR. Um, actually, only about 50% of cases of OPLL can be seen on MR. Uh, <clears throat> the way to differentiate this from more focal processes is to remember that it occurs along the full course of the posterior longitudinal ligament. This is in contrast to calcified discs, osteophytes, and ingiomas, which are more regional phenomena. 50% of patients with diffusive idiopathic skeletal hyperoscosis have uh, OPLL. DISH involves osteophytosis of the anterior lateral spines, ossification of the tendon, and ligamentous insertions. You see a lot of periarticular osteophytes. One of the key helpful differentiations here is to note that the disc spaces are largely preserved in these patients. Um, sometimes you see mentioned that the main differential here is going to be with ankylosing spondylysis, but DISH is a much more florid process than AS and rarely confused with that disease. Another phenomenon that occurs uh, in the extradural space is epidural lipomatosis, which can involve either the thoracic or the lumbar spine. Uh, and this can produce forward or cauda equina compression. This is a real phenomenon that can produce real neurologic symptoms. It can be secondary to either exogenous or endogenous steroids, or it can be seen idiopathically, particularly in obese patients. Epidural hematomas. Um, these are fairly straightforward, but they can be high tests. These are the kinds of cases that you want to look at a lot before the exam, because you don't want to miss it, uh, given that this test has now become more of a test to rule out people who are dangerous and not dangerous. Uh, basically, uh, your GRE sequences are going to help you in some cases because of the susceptibility artifact uh, from blood. Uh, these tend to occur more commonly in the posterior space when they're spontaneous than the, than the anterior epidural space. Um, it's pretty straightforward diagnosis, but just get used to looking at sagittal spines. Now I just want to turn your attention to a few examples of unique radiographic occurrences that have unique differentials. Um, probably the uh, most general and easiest one is decreased vertebral body density. Um, we see that most commonly with osteoporosis, where we see this generalized diffuse um, uh, throughout all the two bodies, we tend to see associated with disease, compression abnormalities, etc. But we can see decreased density in various stages of Paget's disease. Certainly osteomalacia, which is more related to metabolic processes, can also produce a diffuse uh, loosens, loosened appearance. And then multiple myeloma, which can produce these sort of punched out large lucent lesions within the people's bodies. A classic is the ivory vertebra with increased uh, density. Um, the differential here, and you can read this in many places, um, usually there are ways of distinguishing these lesions um, from one another. Uh, certainly when, if you get a case like this, you want to think about maybe recommending a CT scan, uh, which will help you distinguish habits, say, from metastatic processes, and certainly from infection, which should uh, produce a <coughs> rather characteristic appearance. Although sometimes, you know, obviously it's very hard to di distinguish between infection and metastatic disease. But hemangiomas also has a classic appearance, uh, which is most readily seen on CT. And then finally, there's uh, uh, scalloping. Uh, and I remember always uh, having trouble finding uh, a good list of differentials for uh, posterior vertebral body scalloping, so here it is. Uh, scalloping can be due to either congenital uh, processes such as those listed, neural amnesia in association with neurofibromatosis, taylor Danlos and Marfans, and it can also be associated with the increased central canal pressure that is associated with syringohydromyelia uh, and spinal canal tumors. 
The case on the right is an example of uh, posterior vertebral body scalloping in association with neural aphasia uh, in relation to neurofibromatosis.